Some background information before I start. I'm a 23-year-old female, and I live in a very rural part of Tennessee, at the base of the Cumberland Plateau in the Appalachian Mountain Range. It's so remote that I can't even get internet hooked up at my house. I have to use mobile data if I want to access the internet. Despite how remote it is, I do really enjoy living so far out in the country, and I expect that I always will. My boyfriend and I have two very protective dogs, Roxy and Cracker Jack. We also have grown up around firearms and know how to use them. We genuinely felt safe being alone in our isolated house. We have a two and a half acre property, and our closest neighbor is over three acres away. So no one has any reason to bother us and come on our land uninvited. This happened to me back in late November. I was enjoying my night off from work as a caregiver while my boyfriend was working late and would not be home until 2 or 3 in the morning. This didn't bother me as I've stayed overnight at my house plenty of times alone in the past two years. I decided to go to bed early and wake myself up in a few hours when my boyfriend got home so I would be awake to greet him. I climbed into bed with both of my dogs and fell asleep. Around 1.30 in the morning, my bigger dog, Roxy, started growling deeply at the bedroom window and woke me up. I tried to get her to hush, fairly certain there was a coyote or something roaming around our yard, but she suddenly started barking extremely loud. I hear something crash and fall outside against the bushes by my bedroom window. Roxy bolted to my bedroom door and started scratching it, still going crazy and barking while trying to get out. I quickly get up out of bed with my other dog, grabbed my loaded revolver from under my bedside table, and opened my bedroom door. Roxy sprints to the front door and starts clawing at it, like she's going to break it down. I paused and thought for a second before opening it. If it really was just an animal out there, I didn't want my dogs loose to sprint after it into the darkness and possibly never be seen again. I decided to look out the window that was beside my front door and get a sense of what I was dealing with. What I saw more than shocked me, it honestly scared me. There was a man, wearing jean shorts and a white tank top running away from the house, heading towards the road. I didn't know if I should release the dogs to chase him or call my boyfriend or the police. After a moment, I decided to call the local sheriff's department. I explained to the dispatch lady what had happened, making sure to mention to her what the trespasser had been wearing. The dispatch told me that they would send a deputy out to my area immediately. She asked me if I wanted to have them come by my house so that I could make a report. I said that I did. After I got off the phone with the dispatch, I called my boyfriend and told him everything. He immediately said that he was leaving work and coming home. When he got home, he took a flashlight and the dogs and started looking all around the outside of the house for any traces of the intruder. He didn't find anything, except for the damaged bushes underneath our window. We waited for nearly two hours for the deputies to arrive, but they never showed up. I didn't receive a follow-up call of any kind either. In the days that followed after the incident, my boyfriend came to the conclusion that it must have been one of our shady neighbors that lived a couple of miles up the road from our house. That may very well be true, but what bothered me the most was of all the places the stranger may have tried to enter the house, he chose to try to get into my bedroom window, where I was sleeping. If he was just looking to rob us, why hadn't he tried to enter through the front door, or the garage, or back porch? And also, all my neighbors know that we have dogs, and it seems like this intruder wasn't aware of that. I may just be paranoid and jumping to conclusions, but I don't think this guy was interested in robbing us. I think he may have been up to something much worse. I have a co-worker named Paul who was in the Navy back in the 1970s upon the USS Shreveport. We got to talking one day about the perils of being at sea and how in some instances the weather can be the least of your concerns. Paul explained while being stationed on the transport ship, the crew used to be paid in cash every other week, which I found strange as they couldn't exactly go anywhere to spend their money and food was provided. He told me that the sailors would predominantly use their earnings to gamble, and playing cards was the usual method. There were a few individuals on board who acted as loan sharks, and during the week in between payments, would loan out cash with high interest rates. 
Paul worked as a cook in the mess hall. He was acquainted with another man in his division. We'll call this man Jack. Jack was constantly behind on his debts to the loan sharks. Keep in mind, there was no place on board the ship where the loan sharking sailors couldn't find you. And it's not as though you could seek help from the officers. Jack finally fell so deep in the debt, he wasn't going to be able to repay what he owed. And once back on land, the debts were nullified. But the men he owed money to weren't about to let his balance go unforgiven. Every day aboard the ship, the crew would be lined up for roll call. One morning, Jack wasn't in his designated spot. He would never stand there again. The entire ship was searched, but no trace of him was ever found. It's only speculation, but Paul believes that Jack met a grisly end and was thrown overboard. What better place to dispose of a body than over the side of a Navy vessel at night? An investigation was conducted. The crew was questioned, but no proof of foul play was ever uncovered. It was concluded that one way or another, he ended up in the water, and it was ruled an accident. The problem with that theory is that aboard every ship, regardless of the weather or time of day, there's a watchman stationed at the stern of the ship, keeping an eye on things, watching for anyone who's fallen overboard and calling for help. For that poor soul in the water, that vigilant sailor, is their one and only chance for rescue. And if they fail to spot you, you're as good as dead. It's entirely possible that the watchman did not see Jack as he floundered in the waves, but the far more likely scenario was that he was already bound and unconscious or dead before even hitting the water. It makes you wonder how many countless bodies have been tossed overboard, claimed by the sea, and forgotten by history. Let me start off by saying that I'm 5'2", 130 pounds, former military. I may be a little bit on the small side, but I don't scare easy. I got hired by a security company working the graveyard shift. I had a specific routine I had to do. Points to hit with a magnetized wand. Keys to unlock doors and gates at specific times. Nothing that I couldn't handle. I was already a bit of an insomniac. And driving helped to clear my mind so the job was almost ideal. After training on a new route for a few days, I was ready to hit it on my own. This specific route took me to the edge of the city, where the warehouses met the country. There was no traffic, and very few light posts. Even the cell service was a bit sketchy. I didn't understand why, but the guy that trained me was part Native American, and didn't care much for the route. I soon understood why. The company cars we drove were hybrids, which were very helpful because I didn't have to stop for gas at all during my route. My night started off normal. I picked up my keys from dispatch, checked the vehicle, and hit most of my points on schedule. I had my work phone and my personal phone in the cup holders of the vehicle, and my giant flashlight on my hip. I made my way to the outskirts of town to hit my next checkpoints. I exited the highway and didn't notice anything unusual. No traffic. No people. The area was dimly lit, and quiet as usual. I pulled around the warehouse to the side gate where my checkpoint was. That's when I noticed a dark figure standing under the light post a few yards away. Strange, but not a crime. So I continued to make my way forward. The figure simply disappeared into the mist. Now I'm spooked. I froze. I didn't want to get out of my vehicle, but I didn't want to lose my job either. I talked myself into getting as close as I could to the gate without actually getting out of my car, hitting the checkpoint quick, and getting the hell out of Dodge. I tried convincing myself that I hadn't seen what I thought I had, and the figure simply walked away through the darkness. But just as I approached the light post, my damn car turned off. It was like the battery shorted out. There was no lights. It didn't turn over. And soon after, the light post shortened out as well. There was no way in hell I was getting out of my car. I tried to call dispatch on my work phone, but it was dead. Next, I tried calling my coworker from my personal phone. There was only static. In a panic, I tried hitting the steering wheel, and the car turned back on. I floored it all the way to the highway, nearly forgetting to turn the headlights back on. 
I didn't go back to that checkpoint all night. When I was questioned about it from my boss, I explained what happened, and he simply said, No one told you? Apparently everyone knew something weird went on at that warehouse, and no one had bothered to tell me. Either convinced that they were individually crazy, or because they thought I wouldn't believe them. I pleaded to be put on another route, but was softly denied. Before I reached the area the next time I was on patrol, I request my supervisor to meet me at the checkpoint, should my vehicle malfunction again. He informed me that he would be a few minutes behind me. Slightly satisfied, I exited the highway. It was a typical quiet scene, but I was on edge. I felt my paranoia kicking in. I turned the corner to the checkpoint, and the road was empty. I took a quick look around and got back in the vehicle, but as soon as I closed my door, I saw a woman in a pink dress standing in the middle of the street. Slightly creeped out, I closed my door and tried to get a good look at her before calling dispatch. She had long black hair covering her face and was carrying a beat up summer hat with a red ribbon around it. The woman staggered in a mechanical way to the side of the road opposite the warehouse, leaving me enough room to pass. I decided to chance it rather than wait for her to approach me. I floored it, and the vehicle slows to a halt a few feet past the woman. What the hell? I scream, beyond frustrated, punching the steering wheel, calling my supervisor only to receive no answer. In my rearview mirror, I see the woman walking towards me, and then suddenly, disappear. I freaked out and started frantically turning the key, but it still wouldn't start. The woman suddenly appeared at the passenger window. She then screamed like she was a banshee on fire. She then banged her bony fists against the window. I was trapped in a useless sardine can of a car with no way to defend myself or call for help. All I could do was keep trying to turn the ignition. The woman continued beating on my window and screaming about how she can see me. She hit the window again, and it cracked. I considered making a run for it, but before I could decide, I saw headlights. Another vehicle with their high beams on rounded the corner and raced towards me. The woman vanished, but the crack on my window remained. I turned my key again, and the engine kicked into life. The car that came from around the warehouse turned out to be my supervisor. He then called me up and instructed me to follow him to the nearest gas station so he could check out the damage that was done to the car. Once we got there, he found a few scratch marks down the side of my vehicle, like something had crawled its way up from under it. There were dents in the passenger door like someone had kicked it with a boot, and of course there was the crack in the window. There was no plausible explanation for the damage. We reviewed the security footage from the warehouse and saw my vehicle drive up to the checkpoint in perfect condition. As I began to drive away, the footage went fuzzy. It was only when my supervisor arrived on scene that the security footage resumed. That was more than enough for me. I resigned from my position and decided the day shift was the place to be. My hometown hit the national news on April 16th to April 23rd, 2017. The Facebook killer was found at a local McDonald's and was chased towards the downtown area where he eventually shot himself. This story is about my very close encounter with that man. I'm a 25-year-old female. It all started on Sunday, April 17th. It started out as a normal day. I woke up around 3.30 p.m., as I work the night shift at a local fast food restaurant and I'm not due in to work until around 5 p.m. Work continued as normal until my boss got a text from his roommate saying that there was this guy that shot an old man and filmed it on Facebook Live. Because we had been here all night, we hadn't heard of it yet and there were reports of him being seen in our city at a store that was near the restaurant. Although these reports were unverified, and the police said that there was no reason for them to believe that he was here for sure. My boss dismissed it as social media frenzy and misinformation, although he didn't make sure to double check our lobby doors to make sure that they were indeed closed and locked. The rest of the night went like any other Sunday night. I woke up again around 3.30am 
and hopped onto social media trying to see if they found the Facebook killer. To my dismay, he was still at large. But luckily, there were reports that he was spotted in Philadelphia. I was relieved and decided that I would walk home that night. My shift went by slowly, but smoothly. At around 2 a.m. I got out of work and decided that I was going to stop by a 24-hour store that was nearby. I picked up some groceries and was done around 2.45. As I was walking home, I see a man in a white Ford Fusion. I was extremely paranoid at this point, so I dove into some bushes hoping and praying that he didn't see me. The car ended up pulling into another fast food restaurant, but without stopping the car, he turned around and pulled away. I continued to sit in the bushes until his headlights were out of sight. I then booked it home and went straight to bed. The next morning I woke up and found out that the Facebook killer was seen in my city driving, you guessed it, a white Ford Fusion. He had been spotted the previous night about 500 yards away from where I work. While I was in the bushes the previous night, I had seen him shortly before the police chase started that eventually ended in him taking his own life. I understand that this story may not seem very scary, but to me, it could have meant my life had he seen me. He stated on a Facebook Live video that he was going to kill as many people as he could before the police caught him. In retrospect, I probably should have called the police as soon as I saw that car. But obviously, I wasn't 100% sure it was him at the time. I'm still pretty on edge about it, and I feel very sorry for that poor man that he killed. This man was severely mentally ill, and he should have got the help that he so desperately needed before going off the deep end. I come from a small town in central Kentucky. There wasn't a whole lot to do there on weekends, and even less to do when I was a teenager living there over 20 years ago. There was a few tourists that came through the area because the original home of Abraham Lincoln is there, a few miles outside of town. The neighboring counties have well-known bourbon distilleries that have tours available during the day. The two major cities in the state were about an hour away. However, for the youth, there isn't much in the way of entertainment. There wasn't a movie theater or even a Walmart in my county. It's a small farming community where you know over half of the people by name and recognize the other half because you've seen them so many times and just haven't been introduced. On the weekends, if there wasn't a home football game on Friday night, we would just ride around in a two and a half mile loop and stop at one of the three spots where the local youth would congregate. If there was nothing going on in town, we would just take to the country roads and just drive around with no real destination in mind. There were usually a few beers involved, but nothing that would put one in danger. On one such evening, there was a few of us on the road that we had all driven down hundreds of times, when something happened that I will never forget. The road in question is somewhat of an attraction, as it's where a site called the Donkey Tree can be found. The Donkey Tree is a regular tree except one of the lower branches is unusual and that it bears a remarkable resemblance to a donkey's head. The mouth, nose, eyes, and even ears which are two branches splitting off the top of the head, are all distinguishable. As we passed the donkey tree, the air changed. It felt like the temperature dropped suddenly. It's not unheard of for that type of temperature change to take place when a thunderstorm is approaching. The intersection of warm, humid air and cool, dry air make for one hell of an atmospheric spectacle. However, this temperature change was different. The sky was clear, and the stars were shining bright. As peculiar as it was, it wasn't something that caused me major alarm. I kept driving in the same direction, and just a bit down the road, we encountered the smell of decomposing flesh. This isn't a very uncommon thing, considering when you grow up in the country, there is always roadkill that stinks until nature can clean up the carcass. There's also the possibility that a head of a livestock had died in the past couple of days, and the farmer who had owned the animal hasn't had the chance to dispose of it properly. It was the strongest decomp smell that I had ever experienced. It was as if it was in the car with us. I sped up the car to try to leave the putrid smell behind us as quickly as possible. After getting a couple hundred feet down the road, I thought I noticed something in the rearview mirror. It was at that point that I saw something that I can only describe as a human head. Only, there wasn't a body. 
it was only a head that was floating or chasing us in midair. It was right outside the back window of the car. There are several curves before reaching the end of the road, and every curve I took, the face was right behind us. I couldn't shake it. The eyes were as black as night, and it wore a grin that made my blood freeze. Then, it morphed into a demon head, red face, horns, and large canine teeth, but it still had those dark eyes. It changed into more terrifying faces, but by that time it was so much of a blur that I can't even remember them all. It must also be noted that this took place on a short stretch of road, and the time that elapsed was less than a minute from start to finish. My friend in the passenger seat noticed the terrified look on my face and looked back. The look on his face let me know that I wasn't the only one seeing whatever it was that was following us. Through all the stammering that he produced, only one word was audible. Go! It wasn't even a yell. It was barely a whisper. I didn't need to be told twice, or even once as it turned out, because I put the pedal to the floor and that poor car had the hardest half mile it ever experienced that evening. I should have wrecked on a couple of those curves, but as I neared the end of the road, the floating head stopped on a dime and quickly disappeared into the night behind my taillights. I can't explain why it suddenly stopped its pursuit of me and my friend, but as it did, the temperature returned to normal and the smell was gone, and there was a peacefulness about being there. Later, when I asked my friend about what he saw, he described something completely different from what I remember seeing. Maybe the devil appears to everyone in different forms, even if witnessed at the same time. I don't know about that. I have since moved from that small town in central Kentucky, and I don't often reminisce about the cruising we did as teenagers. However, I still occasionally think about that evening, and even after all these years, it still gives me the chills. This happened to me last spring. I live in a quiet part of northern London and attend a very academic all-girls school in my neighborhood. Since my school is extremely prestigious, we were required to complete the Bronze Duke of Edinburgh program as part of the school curriculum. When our first ever expedition for Duke of Edinburgh was coming up, we all felt pretty confident about it. But since we were a useless bunch of teenagers, our teachers thought that it would be helpful for us to practice setting up I didn't like the sound of that at all. It was just so utterly creepy to stay in school overnight on some tiny playing field at the far corner of the campus. The most disturbing part about that field was that it faced an abandoned building. Even though it was separated by a stone wall, it still looked creepy. It was one of the only abandoned houses in the neighborhood, and the fact that it was such an oddity made the situation even worse. We came to school in the evening to practice setting up the tents and it was kind of weird seeing the school without any students in it. It seemed so much bigger. I was in the same tent as my best friend Kate, because she was assigned to my group for the expedition. As I expected, I was not able to fall asleep easily in the tent, so I just kept going through my phone until it was late, and I was sure that everyone was asleep, including Kate. I started to drift off around 2am, but then it started to rain, and it was in that moment that I understood that I should have been listening to the teacher's explanation of how to correctly put up a tent, because it slowly started to fill up with water. I imagined that we probably hadn't zipped up the outer layer of the tent properly, so I gathered every bit of strength that I had and climbed outside, leaving my phone. I struggled for a while but ended up successfully zipping up the tent. By the time I had finished, I was soaking wet so I decided to grab a dry hoodie from my PE kit. I made my way over to our PE department, which had been left open in case we needed to use the bathrooms. The halls were pitch black, so I was really creeped out. I went to the changing room, turned on the light, and changed into my dry hoodie. When I pushed down the door handle to leave, for some reason I found that it was stuck and wouldn't budge. It felt as if someone was holding the handle on the other side, so being my 14 year old self, I asked quietly, Hello? No response. I then asked in a very firm and clear voice, sounding braver than I felt, 
Is there anybody there? Again, there was no response. I started wiggling the door handle so hard that it came off in my hand. At this point, the lights went out in the changing room. The situation seemed as though it was straight out of a horror film. But reality was catching up to me as I understood that somebody really was on the other side of the door because the light switch in the changing rooms was outside. I was about to have a panic attack. So without thinking, I started banging on the door and kicking while screaming help at the top of my lungs, desperately hoping that a teacher or a security guard would hear me. I think it only angered the person as I saw part of the door which the handle was screwed onto slowly begin to turn. I immediately ran to the other side of the changing room and locked myself in one of the shower stalls, which was really the only place that made sense to hide. As soon as I locked the stall behind me, I heard the door opening and heavy footsteps entering the room. I suspected that it was a man. I tried to silence my breathing with my hand, but I don't think I did a very good job, as the footsteps soon stopped right outside my shower stall. At first, I couldn't quite comprehend what he might be doing, but then, I saw an eye glaring at me through one of the gaps between the door hinges. That was the most scared I had ever been in my life. I screamed like there was no tomorrow. I swung the door open as hard as I could, smashing the man in the face. I ran out of the changing room and down the hallway while screaming so loudly, my own ears began to ring. The building was about 20 meters away from the playing field, but I remember as clear as day while I was running away, I turned around and saw a figure in a dark hoodie, so I ran as fast as I could while screaming at the top of my lungs, which woke up most of the people that were sleeping in the tents. I had a panic attack and couldn't breathe correctly for about 10 minutes. I later explained to the teachers what happened. They called the police, but the man was never found, probably because I had given him plenty of time to escape. Everyone was sent straight home after that. I suspect whoever he was, he had been watching us from the abandoned building across the way. That night still haunts me to this day. When I was 12, my family lived in an isolated house deep in the woods. I remember that it was December, just before Christmas, and we were gathered around the Christmas tree in the living room watching TV. At maybe around 10 o'clock, I decided to go to bed. My bedroom was on the ground floor, while everyone else's was upstairs. I remember I fell asleep without much trouble, but later on that night, I awoke, seemingly for no reason at all. I rolled over to face the window that sat next to my bed. The side of the house where my window faced was pressed right up against the trees. For anyone to look inside, they would have to walk through the undergrowth and duck under some branches just to come close. That was the reason that I didn't have curtains. I figured that there was no point. When I woke up, a terrible, vulnerable feeling washed over me right then. A feeling that I had never experienced before next to that window. It felt as if I was being watched. There was no light on in my room, but likewise there was nothing illuminating outside my window either. I stared at the window for a few moments, and then I sat up. I thought, and it was just a thought, that I saw a shuffle of movement outside when I sat up, but I didn't hear anything. After another moment, I laid back down, and even though I felt uneasy, I drifted off to sleep. A short time later, I don't know exactly how long, I woke up again, this time because I was freezing cold. I shivered, rolled over and climbed out of bed. I suppose I had already forgotten about the feeling I had earlier. I left my room, walked down the hallway without turning on any lights, and entered the kitchen. As I made the turn into the breakfast area, I felt a freezing cold breeze on my face. That's when I literally froze in my tracks. The back door was wide open, and snow was collecting just inside on the floor. I saw the faint outline of tracks leading in, but none walking away. There was a ringing sensation in my ears, and for a few moments I found myself completely unable to move, even just to turn around. That's when I heard the slow, quiet turning of the door handle to my right, which led into the laundry room. I don't know exactly why I ran to the gun in the closet instead of upstairs into my parents' room, but that was the first thought in my head. Get a gun. 
defend myself. I took my hunting rifle from my closet and raised it just as my parents had taught me. The gun was not loaded, but I figured the rifle alone would be enough to scare off the intruder. I saw a dark figure peek around the entrance to the kitchen. I couldn't make out any details, only that it was an adult. I'm not sure how well the figure could see me, but I stammered out, I, I have a gun. What the figure said next, I can remember clearly to this day. In a happy, sing-song voice, the person clearly spoke my first name and then added, I'm not going to hurt you. I'd never hurt you. I didn't recognize the voice. I had no idea who it was, but he knew me. I screamed like I was on fire. I dropped my gun and sprinted back to my room. I locked the door and hurled myself under the bed. I heard the man calling my name as he followed me down the hallway and made his way outside of my bedroom door. That's when I heard my father scream from the top of the stairs. I heard the intruder bolt back down the hall and out the door into the snowy night. It took a while for me to calm down enough to go and unlock the door for my parents. For a while, my parents pretended not to know who he was. But a few years later, when I was older, my dad admitted to me that the man was a former friend of his and had taken a special interest in me. He had repeatedly asked my father if he could take me out to go shopping or for ice cream. When my father refused, he started stalking me around our own property. I never had a clue about any of this. My parents called the police and pressed charges, but if the man was ever caught, I never heard. I ask my parents about him every once in a while, and they always say, it's over, don't worry. This story is not my own. It was told to me by a close friend. Back in 2012 when my friend was 13, he and his family owned a small farm in the middle of a Native American reservation, nestled among a small community of other natives. One night in July, they were having a family gathering. They gathered around a bonfire in one of the back fields and told stories of their heritage and legends that had been passed down through the family for generations. My friend, who I'll refer to as John, eventually turned in for the night with a handful of his cousins. John hadn't been asleep for very long when he heard a manic commotion from one of the barns. He heard the horses screaming, panicking, and kicking against the walls of their pens. He opened the RV door and looked out towards the barn and saw that his father and uncles had sprinted that way already, weapons ready. They called out to the boys to remain in the RV with the doors closed. Before his family could even arrive at the barn, the noise stopped, and once they got to the doors and entered, there was no sound of gunfire. John and his cousins waited by the window for a few minutes, and when the adults left the barn, they were all speaking softly in grave voices to each other. They slammed the barn doors shut and bolted them and patrolled the grounds until daybreak. John remembers watching them circle the property for a while before finally falling asleep. His father was very distant over the next few days and refused to let John enter the barn or tell him what exactly happened. Being 13, as the days went on, John forgot all about the incident, even though most of his family lingered at the farm until long after they intended to. The following week, after the family had left and the barn had been reopened, conspicuously absent of any horses, John began to notice a dark figure that would be seen lingering at the edge of their property, right where the fences ended, staring silently at the farm. Once he got close enough to the figure with binoculars to make out that it was wearing traditional native garbs, much like a shaman or a healer would wear, he never had any desire to move closer to get a better look. He would tell his parents about it, but they would always silence him immediately and tell him not to speak of it to ignore it completely. After a while, it became difficult to ignore, however, because it would start appearing closer and closer to the house, showing up on the property, within the fence, always staring at the house. John never saw it coming or going, always just standing dead still. The family didn't discuss it, but John could tell that they all had it on their minds. Everyone was on edge, irritable, and seemed on the verge of panic. 
His father cut himself off from the family after a short while and almost never left his bedroom. A short time later, John started having horrific nightmares. Each time, he was slaughtered, torn to pieces while still alive, unable to defend himself. Once he awoke from one of those nightmares convinced the dark figure was standing just outside his window, peering in at him. His siblings admitted to having nightmares as well, so they went into their father's room to speak to him. John recalled the look of hopelessness in his father's eyes. For the very first time, he acknowledged the figure. He told them the thing wanted them to fear it, but if they collectively ignored it, it would leave. That night, John awoke to find his brothers already awake and sitting up in bed, staring at the bedroom door. John could hear a low growling coming from behind it, and then, so slowly he could barely see it happening, the door swung open. Through the door, from the darkness, came the tip of a snout, then a mouth with rows of fangs. It wasn't low to the ground like a normal animal would be. It was much higher up, maybe shoulder height for an average man. John ducked under the covers, attempting to ignore it, but his brothers continued to stare. They later told him a beast, similar to a wolf or a coyote, entered the room on its hind legs, staring at each of the beds. John's youngest brother screamed, and when he did, the thing seemed to fall over backwards, like it was being folded in half. But regardless, it landed on its legs and sprinted out the door. John heard his father's shotgun go off so close by, his teeth rattled. There was the sound of the front door being wrenched open and something tearing across the lawn. And then, there was only silence. John and his brothers were crying when his father came back in. He then gathered them up and told them that they were all leaving and going to stay at their uncle's house for a while. They were never able to get any kind of explanation out of him as to what he saw that night. They stayed with their uncle for a few weeks, and during that time, John's father invited Navajo men to come to the farm and cast banishing spells and prevent the creature from returning. John and his family eventually returned to the farm, but it took him quite a while to grow comfortable being there again. The demon creature never returned. His father eventually sat him down, and told him that what he and his uncles had seen in the barn and what had entered their home that night was a creature known as the Skinwalker. He told him that Skinwalkers were a part of their culture, and even though they were pure evil, there was no need to live in fear of them. If they chose to live as good people and did not fear the creature, it would never return. It's very important to keep in mind that John was never supposed to tell me this story, the Native Americans take skinwalker legends very serious, and speaking of them in any way is practically attracting them to you. Many of you will not believe this story, and that's fine. I'd definitely rather live in a world where these things don't exist, but I do have to emphasize the respect I have for my friend. I know him very well, and I trust him, and for him to speak openly of this experience took quite a lot of guts. I guess if I had a parting message, it would be to really respect the Native American culture. They have this almost magical grandeur about them. They have faced genocide and had their lands ripped from them, and they're still around, and still hold their culture and religion very close to them, and lead incredibly spiritual lives. I personally think that's worth a lot of respect. In late October of 2017, I decided to take a trip to Japan just for the sake of escaping the rat race and having an adventure and experiencing something new. I flew out of Heathrow and landed in Tokyo. I had two weeks to spend by myself just traveling Japan and seeing the sights. After the first three days of exploring the cities, I decided to hit a few local tourist hotspots. One being a particularly well-known forest where people are known to enter and never return. Upon entering this forest, the first thing I noticed was the sensation of how heavy the air was, and how it felt very oppressive and cold. I was immediately uneasy, and the only thing that kept me walking forward was the knowledge that if I turned back, it would have been a waste of an entire day of my vacation. 
There were moments when I forgot how uncomfortable I was, and occasionally I was able to admire the place for its beauty and peaceful nature. The forest was much too large to explore in its entirety. I decided to hike for about an hour on the main path, then return on a different path. I was very apprehensive about getting lost. After a while, I sat down in a sunny spot, unpacked my bag and began to eat the food that I had brought with me. I was nearly finished, when a Japanese man appeared from the woods right next to me, as though he had been hiding there. He was wearing a business attire with a shirt and tie, but he looked very disheveled and confused. We looked at each other for a moment before I stood up and extended my hand and said, Konnichiwa. The man clearly didn't expect to run into anybody, but he gave me a nervous smile in return and shook my hand. He knew some English and I knew a passable amount of Japanese, so we sat down and had a short conversation. I didn't pry into what he was doing there, but he asked me where I was visiting from and we spoke about my home country of England for a while. After the conversation ended, I asked him in Japanese if he was okay, and if he needed help. He stood straight up and smiled at me, and nodded, saying in broken English, This is beautiful place. Enjoy it, for me, please. Then he walked off. The tone of his voice gave me the chills. Now a part of me wanted to run after him and stop him, grab him and keep talking to him and perhaps persuade him to leave this forest with me but another part of me was reluctant to get involved i sat there wondering who i was to interfere with this man's life i sat for an hour hoping the man would return but he never did i packed up my belongings returned to the path and headed back the way i came deciding i just wanted to leave as the sky began to grow dark the weight of the forest's grim reputation started to weigh heavily on my shoulders. I began to move quicker. When I was nearly out, I stopped as though I hit a brick wall. At this point, it was almost completely dark, and there was still no sign of the man that I had spoken to before. Part of me tried to assure myself that he had taken another path, but the more rational side of me knew that wasn't the case. I pulled out my flashlight and made my way back into the woods. I continued back up the path at a brisk walk, occasionally calling out, Konnichiwa, and shining my light around to signal him. When I got to the tree that I had been sitting at for lunch, my heart sank. A single string had been tied to one of the branches and led off into the trees. That string hadn't been there earlier. I swallowed the lump in my throat, and I carefully placed my index finger and thumb on the string and followed it into the woods. I had a sense that I knew what I was going to find, but I continued on anyway. Not out of any sick sense of morbid curiosity, but because I wanted to know for sure. I wanted to be able to tell someone with certainty what happened. I followed the string for a couple of minutes. When I paused, in the darkness ahead of me I heard a faint crying. It was honestly so quiet that I couldn't tell if it was an animal or a human. I waved my flashlight around and called out cautiously, Konnichiwa! That's when the string started to violently shake. An enormous roar made my eardrums ring. <laughs> I then heard a shuffle, as if something huge was finding its feet. Against the glare of the flashlight, I saw two pale eyes reflecting back at me. I then ran. I ran for my life. When I hit the path again, I didn't slow down. I tore out of that forest like every demon in hell was after me. When I escaped the trees, I ran to my car and slammed the door shut behind me. I sat there in the driver's seat breathing heavily. I then started to cry for I don't even know how long. Time was irrelevant to me. I felt an obligation to report the incident to someone. So I drove to the nearest police station and I told them everything about my encounter and the conversation I had with the man, and how I tried to go back for him. I never heard back from the cops. Since returning home, I've checked the website for the latest victims found in those woods. But since I never got his name, I don't know whether or not he was found. I like to think that he exited the forest another way, and returned home and is now doing perfectly fine. I don't know what kind of creature I encountered in those woods. 
but it was the scariest moment of my life, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone else. When my mom was 17, she and my grandparents went for a hike in the Belanglo State Forest in Australia. They had a holiday house in Barima, which they would visit quite often on weekends, so going on hikes was common. While hiking along the trail that they had been down numerous times before, they came across a couple of abandoned hiking packs, like those massive ones backpackers have. The packs were stuffed full of clothes and food, but no one else was in sight anywhere, and there wasn't any obvious sign as to why they had been left behind. This was in the early 90s, before cell phones were common, so they couldn't contact a ranger to come and have a look at them. My grandmother immediately became concerned by the strangeness of the situation, and she convinced my grandpa that they should immediately go back to the car, which they did. A few nights later, after they returned home to Sydney, my uncle called my grandmother into the living room and pointed at the TV. Some hikers from Germany had been reported missing. They were last seen in the Belanglo forest. My grandmother immediately cried out that her gut feeling had been right, even though technically there was no evidence that those bags they found belonged to those exact hikers. Other news reports that came a few years later in 1994 had the entire family in hysterics. The remains of the bodies have been found in the home of Ivan Malat. Malat had massacred numerous victims in the forest and is now known as the Backpack Killer and is one of Australia's most notorious serial killers. It is believed that there are still bodies that have yet to be found. The worst part about it was that the two hiking packs my family found were never linked to any of the bodies. This means that whoever owned them could still be buried in that forest somewhere. On my 18th birthday, my two best friends and I got a hold of a bottle of tequila and took off in my dad's car to the old arcade by the shore of Lake Michigan. It had been closed down for a few years because, no joke, Jeffrey Dahmer had targeted one of his victims there. The police sealed off the place, and it was never reopened to the public. On the far side of the building, though, there was a skate floor, and one of my friends knew there was a way to break in through there. Our plan was to get drunk and skate around before heading to the arcade. We knew we couldn't play any of the games because the power was out, but we thought it would be cool to look around for old prizes and souvenirs. We parked the car down by the lake and entered in through the side door. Even though it said push written on it, my friend pulled open the door and it swung open easily, but only a few inches before a chain caught it. There was enough room for all three of us to slip inside. We each immediately took a shot and turned on our flashlights and began to walk across the wide open skate floor. Our footsteps echoing loudly through the large room. There was empty beer cans and trash all over the floor, but we decided to strap on our skates and ride around in the dark anyway. We were the dumbest kids you've ever seen, but come on, we were having fun. We didn't make it around one lap before one of my friends tripped over something hard that was sticking out of the ground. We all stopped and shined our lights onto the ground and discovered the obstruction was actually a red candle. It had been melted down so far to its base that it sealed itself against the floor. Being the dumb kid that I was, I took an awkward swing at it with my skate and knocked off a chunk of wax. I was going to keep right on skating, completely oblivious to the possibility of tripping over anything else, when my friend scanned his flashlight around the ground and discovered a circle that had been painted on the floor. Inside the circle were many other circles intertwining, and there were at least five or six other candles scattered about. I laughed and said, <laughs> Some exorcism shit went down here, man. My friend skated into the center of the circle where something had clearly been burned, because the floor was scorched in black. I kept laughing, but my friends were more curious than amused, and kept examining the circle. Another friend raised their flashlight to the ceiling just above the circle and looked up into the rafters above. She then said, Do you guys see anything? My other friend and I glanced up. We saw a few chains dangling from above, and something large and bulky was suspended just beyond them. I leapt up and swatted at one of the chains, which was incredibly stupid because I was wearing skates and fell flat on my back when I came back down. 
my friend immediately started choking and screaming, not because of me, but because something wet had struck her head when I made contact with the chains. My other friend shined his flashlight at her and we discovered something dark and red dripping down her face in between her eyes and down her nose. We all freaked and bailed, not even bothering to take our skates off. We awkwardly rolled back to the car and my friend drove out of the property with her skate still on. She insisted that someone had followed us across the property and that she heard heavy footsteps pursuing us. I don't recall hearing anything, but I was pretty buzzed at that point. I forgot to mention that before we drove here, I had a few beers. And being 18, I was pretty much a lightweight. Unbelievably, we made it home safely that night without crashing. In total, we were at the place less than 20 minutes. That building is gone now. Demolished. So whatever was there is long gone now. But that begs the question. What exactly was being suspended from the roof? I'll never be able to answer that question, but I do have a very strong suspicion that the dark red liquid that struck my friend in the face was blood. I'm part of an all-female roller derby league. I would wake up at 6, skate around the local basketball court for about 40 minutes, hit the gym, then meet my team around 8. To be a champion at the sport, you have to be more than just fast. You have to be made of stone and you have to be prepared to knock somebody down at a moment's notice. I've been with the Flying Banshees for about three years now. We were at a match against our most hated opponents. It was at this incredibly old and run-down roller rink. As we were tearing around the court, the lights would often flicker on and off like strobe lights. Add the occasional trickle of water from the leaky roof above, and it was by far the most dangerous course we had ever skated on. We really should have called off the match before it even started. But we hadn't driven three hours just to quit. Normally, before we start skating, there's a coordinator who checks us over to make sure that we're not carrying anything dangerous or illegal on our person. It's no joke. I recall one time someone had hit a razor blade in their elbow pads. Apparently that day, no one checked the other team. Because halfway through the match, as I'm flying around the rink, trying to put some points on the board, I accidentally flew right into a girl on the opposing team and she hit the ground hard. I didn't hear the whistle, so I kept right on going. You don't get into a sport like this without having to eat some floor sometimes. I've been flattened a few times now, but I always get right up and get right back into the game. As I was coming back around the track, I noticed she was standing back up and leaning against the barrier wall, staring at me with pure hatred. Right before I was just about to pass her, I saw her pull something from under her shirt I raised both hands instinctively. The lights flickered, and when they came back on, I saw a pocket knife shoved through the palm of my hand. I slowed to a stop, just staring at it in disbelief. Then the pain hit me like a punch to the gut, and I went down. To make a long story short, I was rushed to the emergency room, and the girl was arrested for assault with a deadly weapon. Turns out it wasn't her first offense. My hand was bandaged up, and I was the first one at our next practice. With the brace on my arm, my teammates took to calling me Claw, so at least I got a pretty cool nickname out of it. One thing that still bothers me though, and sometimes I can't help but dwell on it, but if the lights hadn't flickered when they did, would she have planted that knife somewhere far worse than my hand? Back in the late 90s, my parents used to run a local skating rink in the small town that I grew up in. There wasn't very much to do in town, so most of the time my friends and I would just hang out there at the rink. We weren't the rebellious type. We didn't go out back and smoke cigarettes or anything. We were just all about having fun. Since my parents both had day jobs, the rink would only be open between Thursdays and Sundays, which meant that Monday through Wednesday, I had the rink all to myself. They would often have me meet them there after school, and I would either do my homework at one of the tables or throw on a pair of skates and roll around while they took care of business stuff in the back. One rainy afternoon in February, when the rink was decorated all over with pink and red hearts for Valentine's Day, my mom and I stopped off there after she picked me up from school. I didn't have to do any homework that night, 
so I had the freedom to roll around the rink while my mom took care of some paperwork in the back office. As I was out on the skating floor doing laps while the Bee Gees were playing over the PA system, I noticed what looked like the silhouette of a person ducking behind the barricade. The lighting wasn't very good. Since the place was technically closed, only about half of the overhead lights were on. I was used to skating in the semi-darkness, but I would be lying to you if I said that it was completely safe. There were plenty of isolated spots where I couldn't see just beyond the barricade. Me being a dumb kid, I ignored the possibility of a creepy figure crouching in the darkness and just kept on skating. A few minutes later, I made for the side of the rink to step off the skate floor. When an arm shot out from behind the barricade and grabbed my face, a hand wrapped around my face and covered my eyes and mouth. Seconds later, I felt another arm wrap around my neck in a chokehold. My skates flew out from beneath me as I was being dragged sideways, my legs dragging behind me. I couldn't regain my balance because the wheels of the skates kept sliding around beneath me. Had the intruder continued to drag me, I probably wouldn't have been able to escape, but for whatever reason he lifted me off the ground, maybe to get a better grip on me, and my feet left the floor. I took advantage of that moment to kick the guy as hard as I could, and my skate connected with his shin. The guy cursed and stopped in his tracks, and I kicked him again. He released me, and by a miracle I landed directly on my skates and shot away like a bird, flying across the skate floor to the other side of the rink. I glanced behind me to see the figure exiting out of the back door, holding his leg. A minute or so later I explained to my mom through a river of tears what had just happened. She immediately locked down the building and called the police. To make a long story short, the cops never found who the would-be kidnapper was. I couldn't give a very clear description of him, because it all took place in one of the darkest areas of the rink. Needless to say, this put a stop to my after-school skating sessions for a while. After the incident, we made it a point to check out the place more often and to make sure all the doors were locked and secured. About five years later, my parents ended up selling the roller rink. It was just too much for them to handle on top of already having full-time jobs. People have always asked me why I didn't bite or scream or fight back. Well, in that moment, I was honestly so shocked that for a few seconds I didn't even know how to react. I'm glad I had the clarity of mind to kick out when I did, or else who knows what would have became of me. Despite the terrible experience, I hated watching the place being torn down a few years after we sold it to make way for a new subdivision. Something that has always stuck with me over the years, something that I was too young to realize at the time, was that the kidnapper must have known that I sometimes skated in the rink alone. I sometimes wonder, how many times was I skating by myself, unaware that someone was watching me from the shadows? My twin sister and I rent a small house at the end of a cul-de-sac. Beyond the tree line in our backyard is a chain link fence, and behind that fence is a closed down Toys R Us store. Now I don't recommend that anyone else try this, as it's technically trespassing, but ours is a unique situation, and we couldn't resist taking advantage of it. When big franchise stores go out of business, they liquidate all their stock. Most of it gets heavily discounted for the sake of clearing the shelves while some of the nicer stuff gets packed up and shipped off to warehouses, where I'm sure they will be sold online, but quite a bit of it is just junked. My sister and I would just watch as employees would exit out of the back and dump load after load of merchandise into the dumpsters. Keep in mind that none of it is great quality stuff. In fact, it's mostly cheap stuff. But the way I see it, once it's in the dumpster, it's trash and it's free. After business hours, my sister and I would wheel our rolling suitcase back through the trees, sneak through the opening in the fence, and go dumpster diving. We found a few neat things, mostly posters and displays for video games, some cheap action figures and dolls, and a few board games and damaged boxes. We would collect it all, put it all in our suitcases, and then head back home. Now given that we are in our 20s, we knew that we shouldn't have been doing this. But we couldn't resist saving all this cool stuff that was just going to rot away in a landfill anyway. Most of it we kept, and some we gave away to friends, but we didn't resell any of it online or anything. 
After we had gone dumpster diving about seven or eight times, I was getting tired of it. There's always actual trash in the dumpster as well that we would have to sort through, including old food. Blech. I once had a fly buzz right into my mouth. Needless to say, I was ready to call it quits on the whole thing, but my sister pressured me into doing it one last time. Normally, we would go at dusk, stay for about 20 minutes or so, and then leave. We didn't like going after nightfall because then we would need flashlights, and that would draw too much attention to ourselves. The final time we went was already after dark, mostly because I had procrastinated as I didn't really want to go. When my sister and I slipped through the opening in the fence, I handed her one of those tiny keychain flashlights and told her to keep it handy while she looked around. She hopped into the dumpster and started digging through the junk, which I recall was just mostly shelving and a few of those plastic displays for posters. I was casually pacing back and forth watching the area around us and taking the stuff she handed to me and tossing it into a bag. For the record, neither of us had been drinking. We weren't carrying any weapons and we weren't acting obnoxious and drawing attention to ourselves. We were barely talking. Yeah, we were trespassing. But that alone isn't enough of a crime for what was about to come. After about 10 minutes, I told my sister that it was time to go. She was making too much noise shifting around those shelves, and I was worried about getting caught. I was zipping up the bag when I heard the chain link fence rattle back around where the opening was. Now, in retrospect, this may have had nothing to do with what was about to happen, but a part of me still thinks it's connected. I didn't have a flashlight, so I couldn't glance over into the area to investigate, but I had entered through that fence often enough to know what it sounded like when someone passed through it and this sounded like that exactly. I started tapping the side of the dumpster, telling my sister to hurry up. She pulled out a cracked Iron Man mask and handed it to me, and then began to crawl out of the dumpster. Right as her feet touched the pavement, the lid of the dumpster swung down hard and slammed itself right on her fingers. The sound of the lid falling that hard was like a bomb going off. I jumped about a foot into the air. My sister cried out in pain and cursed, the next thing we knew, there was what sounded like a war cry coming from behind the dumpster. A man steps out from behind the dumpster and swings one of those retractable nightsticks right at my head. It was pure luck that I chose that moment to step backwards and dodge the blow. The baton made a loud clinging sound against the dumpster. The guy screamed like a madman and swung again. I yelled for my sister to run. We abandoned the suitcase. We both sprinted towards the front of the building. The guy started sprinting after us, screaming in a language that wasn't English or Spanish. At first, he was right on our heels, but my sister and I were both in pretty good shape. So after a few moments, we left the guy in the dust. Fortunately, we were both in our sneakers that night. The man then hurled his baton at us, and it clattered across the pavement to my right, but we kept running. Once around the front of the building, we began sprinting to the road and the crosswalk. The guy turned the corner and slammed right into one of those freestanding cement poles that are normally located by the entrance to prevent cars from plowing right through the doors. I glanced over my shoulder and I saw him hit the ground, but the man got right back up like he barely felt it and kept running. When we made it to the intersection, I shoved my sister in the direction of her house and told her to keep running. This is the part that blows my mind. Not only was the man still chasing us, but he was still screaming at the top of his lungs and wielding a stun gun in each hand, both of which were buzzing loudly as he ran. And I neglected to mention that this man was not wearing a security guard uniform. He was just completely out of his mind. I yelled at someone who was idling at a stoplight to call the cops, and then I took off in the opposite direction my sister went. Fortunately, after I crossed the road and ran down a few back alleys, I ended up losing him, but I could still hear him screaming. I doubled back as I watched him run in between parked cars up and down the street, clearly furious that he had lost me. Then, I kid you not, one of his sleeves caught fire. My guess is that one of the stun guns made contact and ignited it. I cut back around a gas station and made it for home. As I heard the sirens approaching in the distance, 
When I got home, I discovered that my sister was safe, although one of her fingers were broken, and she ended up losing two of her fingernails thanks to the dumpster lid. I know this story is kind of comical now looking back, but as it was happening, it was terrifying and incredibly surreal. This guy was dressed in a hoodie and jeans and reeked of sweat. He clearly was not a security guard or anything. He didn't announce himself before approaching us. He just immediately started attacking us. And I have a horrifying gut feeling that he may have killed us had we not chosen to run immediately. My best guess is that he was some homeless guy with some serious mental issues. I don't know whatever happened to him. But needless to say, my dumpster diving days are very much over. So the other night, my friends and I were walking to the movies at around 9pm. As we were heading through the plaza where the theater was located, I decided to stop and have a smoke in front of the empty storefront that used to be Toys R Us. My friends all paused to wait for me and pulled out their phones, while I lazily peered through the window into the darkened store. I noticed the front doors were locked with chains and a padlock on the outside, and I considered how weird that was, securing it from the outside where someone could easily break the lock and go inside. As I looked past my reflection and let my eyes wander down the rows of empty shelves, I noticed a glimmer of light from down one of the aisles. I moved a few steps over and tried to get a better look at what it was, and when I noticed it again, I realized it wasn't a source. It was a reflection. Two points of reflected light were staring back at me, like eyes from deep in the back of the store. I spoke aloud. What? No way! And pressed my hands up against the sides of my eyes to get a better view while my friends asked me what was happening. The eyes shifted, then vanished, only for a second, before reappearing in a new spot a few feet away. I knocked on the window and called out to my friends. Hey, there's someone in there trying to freak me out. As soon as I said that, something large struck the window from the inside, and I leapt back. A metal bracket the size of a frying pan had just been thrown against the window from somewhere deep inside the store. My friends all heard it, and immediately rushed over. But I continued to retreat backwards. In that split second after the bracket struck the window, I thought I saw the eyes shift again and I saw a shadowy figure crawl across another aisle. Not walk, crawl, on all fours. Whatever I was witnessing was either a severely deranged human, or some kind of unknown creature. My friends started recording the inside of the store on their phones, but none of them captured anything except their own reflections and the darkness just beyond the window. I just dropped my cigarette and immediately started walking away. Even if it was just some prank, I was done. We saw the movie and walked home using a different route without passing the store. And to be honest, I forgot all about the encounter until recently. I guess when something strange like that happens, something that we cannot explain, our subconscious just swallows it, choosing to overlook it because it doesn't make any sense. It can't be categorized, so it just doesn't reflect on it. I did some research, and the building is set to be demolished next month. I can't help but wonder, were those chains on the door meant to keep people out, or to keep something inside? I'm part of an exclusive girls-only paintball club. Normally we meet about 8 or 10 times during the summer months, to battle in designated paintball areas. But on occasion during the off months, we choose an isolated private location to meet instead. When the economy crashed back in 08, my neighboring town went to shit, and most of its residents took off. There was an abandoned shopping plaza that was hidden behind a small section of woods that used to house a Toys R Us, a Kmart, and a Goodwill, before the whole thing was shut down. It's been deserted so long that six-inch grass is growing up in between the cracks in the parking lot. Of course, there were chains and fences blocking off the property, but after scoping it out, my girlfriends and I concluded that it wasn't being monitored and security wasn't making regular stops, so we decided to turn it into our battlefield. We broke open a few doors so that we could run through the abandoned stores and make it more fun. Plenty of furniture and shelving had been left abandoned, 
and we dragged some of it out to the parking lot to use it as obstacles for cover. We spent most of our Saturday afternoon there paintballing and recoloring the place with blotches of red and blue everywhere. We were enjoying ourselves, until we heard over the radio the emergency notice to stand down, as someone had been injured. We all gathered in what used to be the Toys R Us stock room. We discovered that our friend had fallen into a shaft that had been hidden underneath a tarp lying on the floor. It was about an 8 foot drop and was only accessible by a ladder that led down into a basement area. Our friend was bruised and shaken, but she would be fine. A few of us helped her climb out, but myself and three others took flashlights down into the section of basement, and we soon discovered something very unnerving. There was a row of iron shackles bolted into the wall. There were scratch marks on the floor and wall, with what looked to be dried blood, it resembled some kind of torture chamber. A feeling of dread overwhelmed me. I can't explain it, but have you ever been to a place where you could just tell something terrible had happened there? The iron chains did not appear to be that old. One of my friends approached one of the scratch marks on the wall. She then turned to the rest of us. This is fresh. We gathered up our crew and left, making sure to take everything with us that may have left clues as to who exactly we were. We anonymously reported our findings to the police and never returned to that property again.